I want to talk about how this project sort of came to be and the importance of collaborative public archaeology and involving multiple stakeholders in uh, doing archaeology in places like Nevada. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the context for the artifacts that we have here and some of the historical background we have for understanding how these uh, artifacts and these woodcutting camps um, help us understand the Chinese experience in this time period in Nevada. Um, so the project started in, in 2010. I was a tiny little uh, master's student uh, in my second semester when Fred Frampton, uh, who was the forest archaeologist of the Humboldt Toyabi, came to the University of Nevada Reno to give a talk, uh, a brown bag lecture, hoping to recruit some students to work in Aurora, Nevada. And he had painted a picture of this town that you know, had multitudes of questions that you could ask about it. Mark Twain had lived there. Uh, for a, a brief period of time before moving on to Virginia City. Uh, so we have pictures of his cabin, for example. Uh, there were saloons uh, and banks and businesses, uh, merchants' homes and domestic structures. And then he talked about this part of town that appears to have been um, set aside for the Chinese, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And I had done some work on Chinese laundries in Montana when I was an undergraduate, so I was... Um, so in 2010, uh, in working with Fred Frampton at, at the main office in Carson City, uh, Eric Dillingham, who was the district archaeologist out of Bridgeport, California, and Cliff Shaw, who was a former uh, Humboldt Toyabi employee who had found some of these uh, Chinese sites around Aurora, Nevada. Uh, in 2010, in the summer, we did some brief survey enough and some historical research enough to get sort of a sense of what was going on with the Chinese in this town. Uh, and so in 2011, we ended up starting a Passport in Time project, uh, which is a volunteer-based uh, program uh, that involves preservation projects, paleontological projects, archaeological projects. So members of just sort of the general public can sign up for these projects through the Forest Service and sort of get an experience of what it's like to be an archaeologist for a summer. Um, so uh, then in 2012 through 2014, we had uh, two years of um, field schools, archaeological field schools through the University of Nevada, Reno, as well. Uh, all told, we ended up with five master's theses, and, and, uh, including my own, and a PhD dissertation, my own, uh, from the research that we did. Uh, the first year, in 2011, we also worked with the Wing Luke Museum in Seattle in order to recruit uh, volunteers of Chinese American descent or Asian American descent. Uh, and then when Bob Morell uh, donated his collection to the Forest Service, we worked with the Nevada State Museum uh, in the Historical Archaeology Lab at the University of Reno to catalog those artifacts and bring you the collection you see here today. Uh, so note about the artifacts. Uh, these were collected from public lands. I would like to remind you all that under current archaeological laws, that is illegal. If you are on public lands and you find archaeology, leave it there. Whether that be a 5,000-year-old projectile point or a 50-year-old tin can, please do not pick it up. You are free to contact your local Forest Service Bureau of Land Management archaeologists. Let them know that they are there, but please leave them behind. Um, we were able to work with Bob for a couple reasons. First off, he was gathering these artifacts in the 1960s, uh, and so ARPA, the Archaeological Resources Protection Act, was not yet in place, uh, so there was no real mechanism to instill fines or anything like that. Uh, also, the sites were less than 50 years old at the time he was working at them, so it wasn't quite illegal under current archaeological law. Uh, and he also, as you can see from the many photographs he took in that back corner, for example, uh, he did a great job of recording sites, uh, finding historical context for them. Uh, so we deemed him more of an amateur archaeologist than a leader in that case. But again, please don't pick up artifacts. So um, these are just sort of our basic uh, collaborative projects. Uh, we did one year on the uh, Chinese part of town in uh, Nevada in 2011. Uh, 2012, we looked at a Jewish merchant's house. We got two master's theses out of that. Uh, did a little bit of follow-up on that in 2013, and then looked at some of the woodcutting camps that the Forest Service knew about. Cliff Shaw, for example, had found many of them. Uh, and then in 2014, when Bob contacted us, we were made aware of several other woodcutting camps, bringing our total of thir uh, sites to 13. And so we went out and did survey of those uh, as well. And all of those involved members of the public, uh, as well as uh, field school students, Forest Service employees. So already we're getting a sense that many different people can be involved in these kinds of projects.
providing different kinds of perspectives. Uh, some of our volunteers, for example, were skilled at uh, metal detecting, so they brought their metal detectors with us. And so we were able to find some trails and things. Uh, so here's just a picture uh, to acknowledge the people who worked with us. Uh, this is our crew. We did two weeks in 2011. The people in bold are people, uh, you'll see their names, Jim Blaze, Lynn Moncher, and Adrian Dale, my mother, who thinks she's an archaeologist now. Um, they came out multiple years, so you'll see their names several times. Um, these underlined names, uh, Sherlane Baldwin, for example, um, are members of the Asian American community that we recruited uh, in this first year. So Sherlane Baldwin, uh, sadly she has since passed away, but she brought her husband Bob and her daughter Amy. Uh, and she brought photos, uh, her family had lived in Bodhi, and so she was able to bring out photographs of her you know, Chinese immigrant ancestors and share her family story with us at the sites of the places where they had actually lived. Um, Frank, Wendy, and Chris uh, were recruited through Wing Luke, uh, and they were instrumental in helping translate some artifacts. Uh, so uh, translating uh, carvings on, oh, I guess this doesn't work, on uh, globular jars, opium tins, coins, uh, and so they were able to help us in the field with translations and understanding perhaps some of the meanings of these. Uh, at one point in the excavations, we kept finding all these animal bones. And Wendy turned to me and said, in China, there's a saying, we eat everything with four legs except the table. Uh, so it was sort of fun to get this, this Chinese insight, this Taiwanese-American insight into what some of these foodstuffs may have meant uh, through the perspectives of someone who was part of these descendant stakeholder communities. Uh, here's our 2012 and 2013 uh, crews. Again, my mother came out every year. Uh, Lynn and Jim came out again. Um, and in 2014, we ran uh, field schools out at the wood cutting camps in particular. And so uh, this is us after 10 days of not showering. <laughs> Just in case you sign up for a pit project. Uh, we also, of course, had help from the United States Forest Service and, and their general employees, uh, people at the University of Nevada, Reno, our field school students, uh, and then uh, Bob, Mia. Um, so Bob came out. Where's Bob? Oh, there's Bob. Uh, Bob and his wife, Mia, came out and was showing us, like, so that globular jar in the back, he was like, I found that right here. And so he was really instrumental in helping us understand where some of these artifacts had come from, apart from his notes. All right, let's get into the fun stuff. So we've got all these different stakeholders coming out to help us uh, with the project. It's very long word. Um, and to help us understand the sites from multiple different perspectives. And of course, you've got Apollonia's beautiful artistic perspectives on the walls here. Um, so uh, my, my master's thesis focused on Aurora. Aurora, Nevada. Mark Twain again lived there for a couple of months. Uh, so Aurora boomed in 1861. Uh, it was deemed fairly rich in gold due to the amount of ore and things that were being pulled out of some of the mines. And being sort of the largest population area, it probably reached around five to 10,000 people by 1863. They made it the county seat. Uh, this right here is the county courthouse up there. Uh, and then they found that there wasn't gold. Uh, and so the population declined pretty rapidly as other towns around it sort of spread it up. But because it was still the county seat, people hung on. Uh, and stayed for a while. And then when neighboring towns like Bodie, Masonic, Candelaria started booming in the 1880s, people tried again to find gold in Aurora. Hint, there still wasn't any gold. Uh, and so by the 1880s, the town pretty much died. Uh, and there were probably at most during the 1880s 500 people in the town. Um, and so in 1883, they moved the county seat to Hawthorne, which was a railroad town, and now an army depot. Uh, and so it was viewed as sort of a more stable base for the county seat of uh, Esmeralda County. Um, and then they split the county in two, the whole thing. Um, and so uh, the town sort of died. Uh, the 1920 census was six people living in Aurora, uh, and the last resident died in the 1930s. And Bodie, meanwhile, was first founded in 1859. It was named after William S. Bodie, who tragically died in a snowstorm, sort of to honor one of the first prospectors in the area. They, they named the town after a misspelling of his last name. Um, but no one really paid attention to Bodhi. They, there were much richer workings over in uh, the Mono Mills area, Mono Lake area. And so it wasn't really in the late 1870s that people started looking at Bodhi again. And they actually found 
really rich supplies of ore, uh, making it one of the most successful mining towns economically uh, in the United States. So its boom period is from around 1878 to 1882, uh, after which most of the mines were consolidated under one, one big mine. Uh, in 1932, there was the Great Fire, which burned down like 90% of the town. Has anyone been to Bodie? Yeah, so what you're seeing at Bodie is what survived the Great Fire, the, those few buildings that survived. Uh, so Aurora, uh, in terms of Chinese populations, Aurora's Chinese population was fairly small, probably no more than 30 individuals at any given time, maybe up to 50 based on census records, tax rolls, and things like that. Um, and I'll get into a little bit of where they lived. Um, Bodie's Chinese population was closer to 300, according to like the 1880 census record. Uh, this is a picture of the King Street Chinatown um, from Emil Billum's book about Bodie and sort of its surrounding towns. You can see, for example, there's an American flag flying from one of the buildings. Most of the buildings are these wood structures that they probably moved into after other people had abandoned them. Uh, but there are around 200 people living in the King Street Chinatown and the rest of the Chinese were living sort of scattered throughout the area. So one of my favorite things about doing historical research, oh, alongside archaeological research, is finding the fun things in the photos. Does anyone notice anything weird in this photo? What? Is there anything weird in this photo that you guys notice? Those are Anyone see the ghost child on the roof? <laughs> um, so this is actually a picture. This is the mine superintendent's house. And so there's a hill behind the house, and so the cameraman set up a camera to be able to look down the main street uh, and the superintendent's daughter wanted to be in the picture so she climbed on the roof in the middle of the winter. Uh, this is the levy house here, it's a Jewish merchant's house, they owned one of the big stores in town and that's where the uh, other seasons of field work worked. Um, also looking at assessment rolls, which I'll show you in just a second, this was a Chinese laundry here uh, and these two houses uh, were owned by uh, with the assessment rolls named China Joe and China Dick, uh, which were probably not their real name. Um, but those apparently were Chinese-occupied uh, buildings. So for my master's thesis, I wanted to get a sense of what's going on with the Chinese. How are they reacting to uh, life? Uh, so this was, uh, this is the 1864 map of the tax roll. And so when I plotted it out, uh, in 1864, the Chinese were sort of living throughout town. Uh, by 1865, they're mostly living on Spring Street. And then by 1890, this is the 1890 Sanborn Fire Insurance map, uh, they're living sort of everywhere else again, and no one is living on Spring Street. So I was curious what's happening here. What is instigating this kind of population shift and, and residential pattern, and how can we see it on the ground? And so one thing uh, that appears to be happening is anti-Chinese discrimination. So according to the different newspapers and assessment roles, there were, again, around 30 to 50 Chinese in Aurora at any given time. They owned laundries. Uh, Xi Kuang, for example, ran a bakery, laundry, restaurant, lodging house, basically it was everything, uh, sort of uh, near the main part of town. Uh, there were doctors, wood chopper servants. Uh, most scandalously, though, there were prostitutes. Uh, and one 1864 newspaper noted the, quote, numerous disgusting Chinese brothels on the streets. And not long after that, Ordinance 32 uh, is passed in May. And Ordinance 32 in 1864 required that all the Chinese live on Spring Street west of Roman Street, this part of town here. And so it went into effect in June. So it appears as though many of the Chinese moved to Spring Street as a result of this. Some stayed behind uh, and were fined under the penalties of the law. It went to court. The newspaper was not kind enough to tell me what happened to that court case. So I'm not quite sure how well it was implemented. It's also possible many of the Chinese just sort of hid from the census taker and the assessment uh, tax collector so they wouldn't be recorded living outside of this town. Uh, Chi Kuang's bakery, for example, uh, advertisements for it on Pine Street in sort of the main part of town here, um, persist even after Ordinance 32. So he appears to have either paid the fines or just sort of gone along with it or the law is overturned. And then by 1890, uh, when the second boom has hit, uh, Spring Street is completely abandoned. And the Chinese are sort of living elsewhere again. So either people have ignored Ordinance 32 or it's uh, undergone some changes. But either way, uh, through the archaeology, we can see that anti-Chinese laws are, are shaping where the Chinese live. 
Uh, so in 2011, uh, this is uh, sort of the extent of where we find Chinese artifacts. They all date to the 1860s, um, including the non-Chinese artifacts that we find on the site. Uh, and so it appears as though after the 1860s and the 1870s and 1880s, this part of town is completely abandoned, even by the Chinese, despite Ordinance 32. This giant hole here where we didn't put any excavation units, uh, this is where we think Mark Twain's cabin was, so we didn't excavate there. Uh, so if you ever want to excavate Mark Twain's cabin, that's where it is. That just sounds like I'm giving you permission to go loot Mark Twain's cabin. There's nothing there. It's also why we didn't excavate there. Uh, so one thing I actually noticed while we were excavating here, because we were wondering why, why did they pick this part of town? Assessments rolls show people living on this part of town, mostly they were miners. So it's possible with the first mining bust, people moved, those miners were the first to leave, so many of these buildings may have been abandoned. And so they may have been viewed as a place where you could easily put the Chinese without them having to construct new things. Uh, Spring Street was also eventually the stage road that turned into the road to Bodie. So you had stagecoach stations, mail, uh, Wells Fargo coaches and things coming down that road. There were also a bunch of um, stamp mills for the mining ore down that road because that's Spring Street. There's a spring on it, so it's one of the few sources of water in the area. Uh, so it probably was pretty loud, pretty noisy, pretty smelly. Uh, and so it may have been viewed as well, we don't want white people living there, but it's good enough for the Chinese. Uh, but one other reason sort of came to us as one of our volunteers came back from the porta potties. Thank you for service for paying for our porta potties. That was a very nice convenience. She came back from the porta potties and said, "Hey, so if you look, your Spring Street porta potties were up here." She came back from the porta potties and said, "Hey, just so you know, two guys just got into a truck with buckets and shovels." They had parked right next to the Forest Service truck and went looting in town. And she came back and none of us had seen them. And so what I discovered was from Spring Street, you can't see the rest of town. And I wondered if the tr it was true the opposite way. So I went to the rest of town and you can't see Spring Street. So my idea then, my theory, is that they may have put the Chinese there because you couldn't see them. It was a place to put them out of sight, out of mind. Uh, so I ran some GIS fancy mumbo jumbo, I don't even know how it works, but it does. Uh, view shed using the topography, the contours, uh, and some key points at the courthouse and sort of uh, residential sites. And from Maine, and you cannot see Spring Street. Uh, and so essentially the Chinese would have been hidden from view. Um, look for my forthcoming article about this. Uh, anyway, so this may have been an attempt to sort of hide the Chinese, and that's why they're picking this part of town, rather than somewhere like up here that's, you know, no one is living up here in 1864. Uh, they're moving them here, and potentially that's because they want to sort of hide them. So even in the 1860s, when there's not a lot of national conversation about Chinese immigration, we see this affecting Chinese lives on this, these sort of smaller scales. This, of course, gets ramped up in the 1880s and 18. <laughs> I, I can't do I can talk that fast, but I can't do that fast. Um, so by the 1870s, 1880s, uh, anti-Chinese discrimination has ramped up to federal levels, uh, culminating in what today historians call the Chinese question, this idea of what do we do about these large numbers of Chinese immigrants that are coming to the United States, uh, to California, to Nevada. And so you get political cartoons run on a national level, like this one here from Harper's Weekly, uh, talking about you know, the plight so it's a little bit more sympathetic to the Chinese. Uh, in California, has anyone heard of the Working Man's Party? It was a political party founded in the 1880s, specifically under the platform of getting rid of Chinese immigration. Uh, they had several prominent uh, state senators and things elected uh, under that party. Uh, in 1882, we get the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, which is the first national immigration law that restricted immigration solely based on ethnicity or race. Uh, if you were Chinese, basically if you were Chinese and you were not of the merchant upper classes, you were not allowed to immigrate to the United States under this act. Uh, and it was consistently repassed every 20 or every 10 years until World War II uh, when uh, the Chinese immigrants who were here sort of successfully proved that they had assimilated. That was one of the main arguments against Chinese immigration was that they were too foreign, their eastern ways were not compatible with western lifestyle their culture was backwards, and so they could never truly become Americans. And so by World War II, uh, Chinese immigrants you know, spoke English, they served in the military, and so uh, the US Congress lifted the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act as a 
So we see this sort of anti-Chinese discrimination taking place on a larger level historically, but we can also see it in sort of small ways in Aurora, Bodhi, and potentially at some of these woodcutting camps. Uh, so in Bodhi, for example, they attempted to found a League of Deliverance, which was a sort of an organization aimed at boycotting Chinese-owned businesses. It didn't work very well. Um, Chinese had a lot of laundries and other, you know, wood that people wanted that no one else was really, really providing. Um, and people also started questioning, like, if my saloon hires, like, all white labor except for one window washer who's Chinese, can I not go to that saloon anymore? People in Bodhi liked saloons, uh, so it didn't work very well. Oh, you could also see sort of the opposite tact. This laundry, for example, uh, in Bodhi uh, advertised always that they only employed white labor as a way of enticing people to frequent their business. Uh, that also apparently did not work very well as uh, they had new owners about every six months. Um, and even without advertising, the Chinese laundries appeared to have sort of outcompeted them. So one way perhaps to escape the uh, anti-Chinese sentiments uh, within these towns, uh, for example, in, in Bodhi's newspapers, there were accounts of a Chinese guy just walking down the street and being punched in the face for no reason whatsoever. So life could perhaps be a little bit contentious uh, in, in this sort of atmosphere of anti-Chinese discrimination. Uh, so one uh, escape to perhaps alleviate concerns that they were taking, it just sounds so familiar, jobs away from white people. Um, they uh, found a niche market in wood cutting. Uh, there weren't a lot of white woodcutters uh, from the records, it appears that we have some early Paiute Native Americans working in the woodcutting industry in the 1860s, uh, and then we have Hispanic woodcutters in the 1880s as well. Uh, so as a way to perhaps get away from Bodhi and Aurora and to establish an economic niche where they wouldn't have as much competition, uh, the Chinese start in the woodcutting industry. And so from tax assessment rolls, we see plots of land being assessed and deeded to the Chinese. And they actually are moving further and further west. These plots are from like the 18, excuse me, 80s, 1890s, 1900s. So as the timber's uh, dying out and as Bodhi, Aurora is dying and Bodhi is getting bigger, they're moving closer and closer to Bodhi. Uh, so based on Bob's uh, time in, in this area, as well as the Forest Service surveys, we are able to identify around 13 of these wood cutting camps some of which Bob knew about and the Forest Service knew about and some that the Forest Service did, but Bob didn't, and some that Bob didn't, and the Forest Service didn't. Uh, so we went out and we did surveys of all of these. <coughs> these photos in the exhibit as well. Uh, this is a photo of two Chinese uh, men on their horses, uh, bringing their burros, their mules, into town laden with wood. And pretty much all the Chinese in the Cessna rolls that are listed as woodcutters have you know, five to ten mules that they own that they're being taxed on, and it appears they're being used as labor animals to bring in charcoal and, and wood. Uh, this is Bodhi. Bodhi. Yeah, there's not a lot of pictures of Aurora. This one's from Bodhi. Uh, so while we were out at the camps, we did maps. Uh, we did uh, some limited excavation. These little red squares, for example, are our excavation units. Uh, we found a lot of commonalities. One common element to pretty much all the woodcutting camps is that they were near a spring or a seep, some sort of permanent source of water. Uh, out of the 13, 12 of them had water in them. And the one that didn't was right next to the road. So they appeared to have been swapping accessibility of transportation for water. And that you could cart water in instead. Uh, pretty much all of them were built out of this dry laid uh, rock. It's all locally available rock. We camped on it, it was not comfortable. Um, but they were making these, these dugouts. There's some really great illustrations of dugouts in that back corner, if you haven't seen them yet. Uh, this site was actually one of the biggest one we had. They had a corral, uh, so we think they're keeping mules, and uh, we do have some records of pigs at the site as well, that they're uh, raising pigs. Uh, so they've built a corral to keep it in. Uh, but really common architectural styles with a few little variations based on individual preferences and abilities, um, but a lot of commonalities between these sites. So what did we find archaeologically, combining all of this stuff together? Uh, so some of this will be repeating some of these things. Uh, so one thing that we found, um, and I'm going to compare these to what we found in Aurora. One thing that we really found at these sites compared to what we found at the, the sort of Chinatown in Aurora was a lot more evidence for labor. 
Uh, so we found hundreds of buttons. It was not fun counting buttons, but there were a lot of them. Uh, these are sort of the fancier buttons that we found. Um, Bob didn't record which ones came from which sites, unfortunately, like he did for the other artifacts. Uh, but the 1880 uh, census record for Table Mountain, which is sort of the catch-all term for up here, uh, listed a Chinese laundry. So we think this may have been evidence that one of the camps had a uh, laundry capacity at it for the woodcutters to come and wash clothing and things like that. I've gone too far. Uh, and then we also found a lot of evidence of uh, woodcutting labor. Uh, so axe heads, saw blades, and also sort of tangential labor. Uh, there's a nice little display about the blacksmithing shops in the center over there. Work glove. Uh, this is a leather shoe. The bottom, you can see in the mirror here, uh, is caulked, meaning it's got a bunch of tiny little nails in it, which were common in the wood cutting industry because you could stand on wood and not fall off as easily. Drill bits. Um, so a lot of evidence that these camps are built because people are performing labor there. And we don't see a lot of that in Aurora. A lot of them probably were. Sam Singh's laundry, for example, uh, next to the courthouse, probably was also his home in surveys. We found a lot of foodstuffs and things like that, along with buttons. Um, but there's a really big emphasis on, on labor at these wood kind of camps that we're not seeing in the residential areas. We also find a lot of evidence that the Chinese were continuing some of their sort of customs and habits and familiar behaviors and foods and things from home and bringing that with them. Uh, so here, another picture of some of the, the large jars that we found. We found all of these at in Aurora as well. So this appears to be a shared trait between these rural camps and these more urban centers. Uh, evidence of opium smoking. Uh, you can read about this ink stone in the back corner. We don't find those a lot archaeologically. They're fairly expensive, passed down, elaborate. See some decoration on it here, but it broke. So it appears as though they discarded it as a result. Um, also, in addition to eating traditional foods, they're eating them out of traditional food uh, serving wear. Um, the one big difference that we see between Aurora and these woodcutting camps is uh, in these two styles of rice bowls. Uh, this double happiness bowl dates to the 1870s uh, and before, uh, while this bamboo style uh, dates to the 1860s and after. And uh, in Aurora we only have these double happiness bowls, which means it's an earlier site uh, compared to the woodcutting camps where we find both. Uh, but we also have some sort of expensive dishes like the celadon bowl and this large rice bowl uh, suggesting that some of the camps are doing quite well that they were able to afford more expensive uh, pottery and ceramic styles. Uh, we also found evidence that they're incorporating things from America, from European culture. Um, so we've got a lot of silverware. Um, we've got baking powder. There's lard cans. Uh, out at the sites, Lee and Perrin sauce bottle. Probably one of the, the best examples that we can see of this historically uh, is the story of Sam Chung, who was a prominent uh, Chinese businessman in Bodhi. And he got into many different businesses, often partnering with uh, white Euro-American neighbors. Uh, so one of his first businesses was this restaurant and bakery just outside of Chinatown on King Street. Uh, it was quite successful. He then went on uh, to found a hotel uh, in Lundy and, and other areas uh, with a former sheriff's deputy. There were some protests against the business uh, out there, but they were sort of alleviated, like, you guys don't have one of these, so this would be really useful for you. Um, he also uh, had some mining enterprises. Uh, he got into the woodcutting business, and all the newspaper descriptions of them are, are very favorable. Uh, he cut off his queue, which was the long braid that the Chinese men would wear. Uh, it was a sign of allegiance to the emperor, and if you cut it off, you essentially could not go back to China. So in cutting it off and wearing Western-style clothing, the newspaper viewed him as sort of favorably assimilating into American culture, and that made him sort of a, a good Chinese immigrant compared to some of the other ones. And then Sam Chung murdered a Mexican woodcutter. And the town didn't like him so much after that. Um, uh, Prudencio Insanos, who was part of a larger Mexican woodcutting uh, group, his donkeys, his mules, uh, trampled Sam Chung's garden. And Sam Chung came out and shot him to death. Uh, they got him to town uh, where he died. And Sam Chung ran to Bodish Chinatown to try to hide before he was sort of ferreted out. Uh, he was put in jail, uh, and a mob came to hang him a masked mob of probably some of uh, Prudencia's friends. 
Uh, but he had already been moved to Bridgeport because they sensed that there was going to be some unrest in the community. Uh, he went to trial four times, and every time it was uh, deferred, first the doctor moved away and they couldn't find him, and then the sheriff who arrested him was killed in a wagon uh, accident, and by the end of the, the year or so, there was no one left to testify against him, and so he got off uh, and went back to Chinatown for a bit. Uh, where the newspaper yelled at him for being far too relaxed about being in Chinatown again, and then he moved away to parts unknown. Uh, but for a while, he, he did quite well in, in Bodhi, doing all these different uh, business enterprises. All right, and then finally what we see is a lot of combination, that they're not just picking and choosing, I can eat Chinese food or I can eat American food. We're seeing an amalgamation where they're combining these elements to make something new. Uh, so we have evidence of opium smoking, but we also have evidence of tobacco consumption. These three bits are from a Colossus pipe factory uh, pipe. Uh, this one here, if you look at it in the corner, you can still see the teeth marks on the pipe stem. Uh, so they're, they're choosing to smoke tobacco as well. Uh, we can see this in decorations. We've got buttons and beads, but then we also have this faux jade pendant suggesting that they're bringing some belief systems about uh, the healing mystical properties of jade with them from China. Uh, we can also definitely see this in ideas of health and hygiene. We've got Chinese medicine models, toothpaste or toothbrushes. Uh, Your American culture wasn't big on brushing uh, their teeth in the 1880s, but Chinese culture had been uh, had invented toothbrushes in like the 15, 1400s. So they brought that idea with them as well. But then they're also using American medicines, uh, Florida water, bitter quell, uh, Harry Davis's vegetable paste. It oh, still has a label on it it's in the back case over there. Uh, so they're combining American ideas of health and wellness with um, Chinese ideas of health and wellness. It also probably helped that many American prescriptions had a lot of things like morphine and cocaine and heroin in them um, and alcohol. So we could have been using them for other things. But. Uh, and then we can also see this sort of in entertainment. Uh, so we know that these are spaces of labor based on the amount of labor artifacts that we have, but they're also spaces of socialization. So this bowl, for example, is big. This would have been for communal eating, a way of sharing food together. And so they're working communally at these labor camps in terms of labor, in terms of food, and in terms of socialization. We've had a lot of evidence of social games, uh, some of which is traditional. So we've got these dominoes. Uh, this small rock here is not like any of the other rock uh, at the camp. And so it appears to have been brought there. Smooth down, we think it may have been a gaming token of some sort. Uh, so instead of gambling with money, you gamble with these gaming tokens. But then we also find, you know, American marbles and harmonica reed plates suggesting that they're socializing as well as entertaining each other, that even though these are spaces of labor, they can also come together to uh, create a sense of community that they wouldn't have had at these rural camps. If they were living in Bodhi's Chinatown, they probably, you know, could have gone down to the opium den or the saloon or the gambling hall or the brothel or, or other places of socialization, gone to Chinese New Year's celebration. Uh, and they don't have that at these camps, so they're building it themselves to these ideas of community. We also find a lot of evidence, especially the, compared to the um, urban centers, we found a lot more evidence of adaption, that they are reusing goods. Uh, so if you're in the middle of nowhere, uh, it took about an hour of driving uh, just to get out to some of these camps and hike into them, so it's going to take a lot longer than that if you've got a mule and a horse or just walking. Um, so it's easier just to make something out of what you have than to try to go into town and get it. Uh, so a crate from the China Nut Company shipped over from Hong Kong becomes a shelf in the wall of your uh, dugout. Uh, a barrel becomes a charcoal sifter. A uh, tin can, uh, you can put two holes in it, nail it to your cabin wall, and you've got a candle holder. And so we see a lot more evidence that they are reusing goods, making things out of other things in order to save time, save money, uh, which is not necessarily something that we see as obviously in these urban centers. Another really interesting thing we found was evidence that they had uh, contact with the indigenous Paiute. So both groups were discriminated against. Uh, in many towns in Nevada, Minden, for example, Native Americans weren't allowed in towns after a certain time. They had curfews. And most of the uh, pictures and things that we have of the Paiute at Aurora show them camping outside of town, that they're not allowed to live in town. And so both groups have these 
stigmas against them that makes them come together in, in new kinds of ways. Uh, so we have stories of the Chinese selling alcohol uh, to the Paiute in uh, California. So it was against California law to sell alcohol to Native Americans, uh, even if they wanted it. And so the Chinese uh, viewed this as a business opportunity, and so they were, they were more than happy to sell alcohol to them. Uh, we also see some business relationships uh, in the 18, uh, 19, Sorry, the 1900 census, Ah Lang, Ah is not a real name, it means Mr. Uh, but for some reason it always becomes a Chinese first name in census records. Uh, he was a woodcutter and he had two, uh, they're listed as servants, but they're probably more employees, um, two Native American uh, employees, uh, a Native American man uh, and his son working for him. But there also may have been some tensions uh, between the Paiute, both of them were in the woodcutting industry, and so there may have been some competition between the two of them. One thing that we found at the woodcutting camps that we don't see in Aurora uh, is evidence of security measures. Uh, so again, the Paiute are living outside of town. The camps aren't occupied year-round. Um, most of the Chinese woodcutters had lots in Bodhi or Aurora, so they would bring wood into town to dry and then sell directly. Uh, and only in really harsh winters would they go back out. Uh, and risk frostbite and hypothermia to get wood. So the camps wouldn't have been occupied year round. And so we have locks, bolts, chains through doorposts and things like that, uh, indicating that they're securing these buildings. And so some of it could have been rivalry with other Chinese or Mexican woodcutters, but it also may have been an acknowledgement that the Paiute are still hunting and gathering in these spaces and you, you want to keep them out of your supplies so they're available for you for next year. So contact with the Paiute, um, Sometimes successful, sometimes uh, contentious, but we do have evidence that these two more maligned groups are coming together in new ways that are completely separate from the larger white population. Which brings me to the story of Chinatown, which you may guess is not his real name, uh, but all of the assessment rolls, all of the censuses, all of the Forest Service documents uh, detailing him list his name as Chinatown, so I have no idea what his real name was. Uh, he first appears in the census in 1910, uh, he is listed in both Aurora and Bodie, so he was reported twice. Uh, in Aurora, he was listed with his wife. He actually married a pipe woman named Ida, who had uh, one or two, it's not quite clear from the census records, uh, previous children uh, from a Paiute man. They're listed as uh, Native American. Uh, and then they had children of their own. So due to anti-miscegenation laws, uh, the, the inability to marry outside of your race uh, for Chinese individuals in the United States. The 1875 Page Act, which limited the number of Chinese women who came to the United States, uh, and the declining economic prospects of Aurora and Bodhi. For Chinese men, it was often hard to start a family, <laughs> to find a Chinese wife. So in the case of Tom, when he wanted to start a family, he married a Native American woman, adopted her daughters, and had several children of uh, their own. Uh, so by 1910, he had a one-year-old daughter. Uh, in Bodhi, he was listed as himself as a woodcutter uh, with two Chinese employees working for him. So two different relationships between Aurora and Bodhi. Uh, in 1910, he has somehow aged 22 or 21 years. I don't know how that math works for the census taker. Uh, and by that point, he has several more children, including Baby Tom, which I'm hoping is not what they kept his name as. Um, but he eventually uh, retired, according to other records, uh, to the Sweetwater River, the elbow of the Sweetwater River, uh, near Aurora and Bodhi, and stayed in the United States rather than returning home. So he was able to start a family and stay. Uh, the Forest Service reports him several times. Uh, Emil Howery, not Emil Howery, that is not the right name. William Mall was the first forest supervisor for the humble, well, what would go on to become the humble Toyami River. And as soon as he started, he kept a diary. And in many entries uh, throughout the 1910s, he reported problems with Chinatown trespassing uh, on Forest Service land to illegally harvest timber. So on September 29th, 1916, for example, he reminds himself to go check Bodhi to make sure that Chinatown is not illegally harvesting wood and selling it. He eventually was arrested uh, and was sent to trial, although the result of that uh, never came about. But Chinatown's listed several times as sort of illegally harvesting timber. Uh, and he also makes a photo in uh, one of William Malt's journals uh, bringing his uh, donkeys, his men to town, to Bodhi, to sell wood. So, so there's one individual we can, we can sort of get a sense that Chinatown is making different choices based on discrimination, his inability in marriage, based on legislation, uh, his personal economic goals, his personal family goals, uh, his, the fact that he's going to 
disobey uh, forest service laws in order to bring cordwood into town. And so he's a nice little snapshot of some of these artifacts. Uh, and by all accounts, his camp was quite successful. So he may have been one of the ones who owned some of these four flowers in Celadon and more um, expensive goods. So thank you, everyone, who helped co-curate this exhibit. Thank you, everyone, at the uh, Nevada State Museum for putting it together. It is gorgeous, and I love it. Um, thanks, everyone, at the Forest Service and everyone at UNM.